Hey students, my name is Roy Lee. Let's talk about general science. Let's talk specifically about physics. Now, if you're watching this course, chances are you're taking a general science course. And general science, it goes by many names. Some schools call it integrated science. Some schools call it conceptual integrated science. Some students, uh, some uh, schools just call it general science. Doesn't matter, right? It's just a combination of all three major sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics. There's also earth sciences, but nobody cares about earth science, right? That's not important, right? Or maybe you're taking an intro to physics class right now, and you're probably within the range of seventh to 10th grade right now, and you're a physics beginner. Okay, and don't be mad that I called you a physics beginner because chances are, if you're good at physics, you're not watching an online video about physics, right? So let's talk about this. A lot of students struggle with general science and for a good reason. They find that when you're trying to study biology, chemistry, and physics all together, it becomes really overwhelming because you're, it's too much information, right? You have to learn everything about physics and everything about chemistry and everything about biology and you're combining it all together in one year long course, so it's too much, right? I have some bad news for you. Uh, the bad news is that's the way science should be taught. That's how science should be taught. And I'm really sorry to bring this bad news to you, but uh, let me try to explain why, okay? When, let's see, when you're eating food, okay, when you eat food, why do you eat food? You eat food to gain energy, right? Biology is asking you this question, okay? So human beings eat food to gain energy how do human beings gain energy, right? That's a biological question. So what do you do? You study the digestive system, you study the stomach, you study the pancreas, you study ATP, you study cellular respiration. These are all concepts in biology dealing with how human beings gain energy from food. Chemistry is something like this. Chemistry is, you say food equals energy. Well, where is the energy in the food? So you start breaking down the food into smaller particles and you say, okay, these are molecules, these are atoms. How are they interconnected? What kind of bonds are formed between these very, very small matter? And what is the energy that's stored inside of them? That's why you study the equivalent bonds. That's why you study ionic bonds. And these bonds are chemical energies that are stored inside of food. Physics is this. Physics is what is energy? What is energy to begin with? That's a physics question. And do you see the relationship here? If you start off with biology, one step underneath, one step further into it is chemistry, and one step further into that is physics. And these three fields of sciences are basically all the same questions, and they're just different tiers of it. And that's why you have to study all three sciences all together, even though it seems really overwhelming. Now, to put it in another way, I can say something like this, okay? In order to excel in biology, you have to excel in chemistry. In order to excel in chemistry, you have to excel in physics. In order to excel in physics, you have to excel in math, right? And you might be raising your hand like this, teacher, yes, I don't wanna live anymore. Listen, I totally feel you, right? And that's why a lot of students struggle with general science because they feel like, okay, I'm not good at math, I'm not good at physics, therefore I'm not good at chemistry, and I'm not good at biology, I'm not good at any of the science and math, and it's too much for me. It's okay, it's okay. Some students, though, if I really grill them, right, if I ask you, okay, among the three science fields, which one is easier? There is a preference, right? Human beings have a preference. So some students say, okay, I find biology tends to be a little bit more easier than chemistry or physics. Or some students might say, I find chemistry to be a little bit more easier than biology and physics. But very rarely do I come upon students that say physics is the easiest among the three. And I thought about this for a really long time. Okay, why do students say physics is so hard? And I really grilled students about this. And I come up with basically three different responses to this question. Okay, why is physics so hard? Students mostly answer it like this. They don't get it. They go to class, they go to school, they go to class, they go listen to their physics teacher. They kind of understand what the teacher is saying, but most of the time it doesn't make any sense. It sounds like an alien language. It sounds like jargon and you're talking about impulse and then force and gravitational force and two objects colliding together. And you're like, what? I don't get it, right? And you end up looking at the window. Here's the thing, okay? If you have this problem, maybe I can help you. Maybe I can help you with relevant explanations, okay? The reason why you don't really understand what your teacher is trying to say is because your teacher's explanations don't really hit home. You don't really understand the examples that the teacher is giving. 
And have you ever come across something like this? Okay, you have two people and they're both talking about the same topic, but the way they pre present the material is a little bit different. Some people talk about the same topic, but in a very clear, coherent manner. So you're like, okay, I totally follow his logic. I understand what he's trying to say. And then you have another person, they're talking about the same thing, but you have totally no idea what he's trying to say, right? It's confusing, even though they're talking about the same topic. Maybe that's the deal here, okay? Maybe your teacher is talking about these physics concepts, but he or she might be uh, a little bit fuzzy in terms of their explanations. That's why it's not really hitting home to you. It's not very relevant to you. That's how maybe I can help you here. Maybe I can explain the same concepts, but in a different way so that it's much more relevant to you so that it, it hits home, that you understand why you're learning these things, okay? Another typical response to why physics is so hard is mathematics. I am terrible at math. Not only do I hate math, I'm, I'm terrible at math, right? So I'm terrible at physics and I'm very scared of physics. That's why physics seems so hard to me. I've designed this course for students like you. Okay. If you are very bad at math, I've designed this course so that you need only the most basic mathematics skills to excel in general science physics. Okay. I, I created this course and I looked at it and I said, maybe I should add a little bit more math to it. And I say, no, 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 I took it away. Right? This is the minimum amount, the bare minimum amount of mathematics that you need to know in order to excel in physics. Because once again, this is not a mathematics course. This is a physics course, right? In order to succeed in physics, you can't not have any math, you need some math, but I'll only let you know just the basic necessities that you need to know. And I'll emphasize it again and again, okay? Just memorize it. If it's too hard, just memorize it. And you need to retain this information in order to excel in physics, okay? So math, minimum level. Don't worry too much about it. Now, the third response that students have when I ask them, why is physics so hard? Is this. This is a situation where they're basically saying, physics is so hard, that I can't even explain to you how hard it is, right? I can't, I can't explain to you why I find it so hard. Listen, if you're at this level right here, what you need is fundamental explanations. You need someone to hold your hand and go over the really basic concepts first, right? Don't start off with matter. Hey, everything's made up of matter. Hey, let's move on. No, you need someone to sit you down and tell you what is matter, okay? Why is matter important? And how matter affects the universe? You need step-by-step -step instruction. And it's okay, everybody starts off at this level. Everybody starts off at this level. And it's just a matter of, can you retain that information? Can you retain the fundamental knowledge and see the logical connections, right? And if you go step-by-step, -step, you'll soon find that you're solving physics problems which you thought were impossible at first, right? At first glance, you thought, how the heck do people solve this problem? But if you see the fundamental logic behind these problems, then you'll find yourself being able to solve these problems, okay? And this course is designed for students like you, so it's gonna be very slow paced. We're, we're going to be going over the very basics of physics here. Now, speaking of the topics that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna be talking about, these are the topics, okay? We're gonna talk about mass, velocity, acceleration, motion in one dimension, projectile motion, Newtonian laws, work, power, energy conservation, gravity, and these topics in physics is called mechanics. Now I wanna pay, I want you to pay attention to this word mechanics here, because if you look at the SAT2, this is the SAT2 physics subject test. This is shown by the college board and it's showing you all the different subject, the content of the test and the percentages of each content. What do you notice? Very top, mechanics, right? Mechanics makes up about 40% of the SAT2 physics test. Meaning that the concepts that we cover here, the mechanics concepts, they carry over. So if you have a very strong fundamental grasp of mechanics, then that means if you're preparing for the SAT2 physics test, you've basically done half the work already. Now it doesn't end with SATs, it moves on to AP Physics as well, right? I want to look at this. This is AP Physics 1 course, and this is a course description for AP Physics 1. And I know it's very hard for you to see it, so I'm gonna enlarge it. Look at this. AP Physics 1 course content. Students explore principles of Newtonian mechanics. Even at the AP level, you're still dealing with mechanics, the topics that we cover here. So as long as you have a really strong fundamental grasp on mechanics, it means that it will go a long way in preparing, helping you prepare for SAT2 physics as well as AP physics as well, if you're interested. Now, what are some things that you can expect from this course? Better explanations than your science teacher in the language of a course. So I've designed this course in both Korean and English. So if you're more comfortable in Korean, go listen to the Korean lecture. If you're more comfortable with English, go listen to English lecture, but I can 
assure you that I give you better explanations than your science teacher. I can also assure you that you get a good grade in the general science physics portion. And like I said before, I've created general science courses for physics, chemistry, and biology. Still, if you take all three, then I can assure you a good grade in the overall uh, general science course overall. And finally, you build a strong foundation for future SAT2 and AP physics tests. So, my name is Roy Lee. I'll see you in the first class. Hey students, general science, we're going to be talking about physics today. Uh, so, as you all know, general science is basically composed of three major scientific areas, biology, chemistry, and physics. Uh, some classes, some schools teach general science in a way that has four different sciences, maybe earth science in the very end, but usually the big three, the major scientific fields are biology, chemistry, and physics. Now, this is a series of lectures and we're going to be covering the aspect of physics today. Specifically, because this is the first class, we're going to be talking about vectors. We're going to be talking about distance and displacement, speed, velocity, scalar, and vector quantities. Now, before I begin, before I begin, I need to talk to you a little bit about how to study physics. Physics gets a bad knack. Uh, a lot of people have this very negative image of what physics is. Uh, number one, it's super hard, it's difficult. Number two, it requires a lot of math. And number three, it's boring as heck. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about how to study physics first. Um, you, have to, you have to study physics in a certain way. The reason why most people find physics hard is because it's a different way of thinking about the world. Let me give you an example, okay? Uh, let's say you're playing baseball and I have a ball in my hand, okay? And I throw it at you. I throw this ball at you, at your face. What is happening? Well, in terms of just everyday normal human way of describing things, you will say things like, oh, here's a man and he threw a ball at my face. That's it, right? And everybody understands what you mean when, I, when you say he threw the ball at my face. But in physics, you're not satisfied with that sort of response. You want to describe what is happening in the most precise, the most accurate, the most basic and fundamental way possible. So when you say, I threw a baseball at you, a physics student would ask you, okay, what was the velocity of the ball? Was there acceleration? What is the distance between you and him, right? And these are all questions that you're like, like, who cares? Like, you understand what I mean, right? And you can't respond like that in physics. You have to get down to the really nitty gritty, like basic things. You have to redefine what certain words mean. You have to think about what it means when, you, uh, when an object is accelerating or, or, or when there's a change in velocity and a change in time. And most people find that, one, really boring, tedious, and number two, because it's boring and tedious, they don't want to do it, which then results in them not understanding what's going on, and number three, it becomes really difficult. Um, Here's what I can say, okay? I'm not gonna lie to you, you need a little bit of math skills. You can't be totally illiterate about math, right? You have to be able to do really basic, fundamental geometry, trigonometry, like these are basic skills that are required from you in order to do physics well. But is it difficult? Not necessarily, okay? And I know that I sound like like any other physics teacher that goes up to you and tells you, hey, physics is interesting and wonderful and it's easy. No, no, it's not easy, but it's not super hard either. It's basically, it boils down to this fundamental question, okay? What is actually happening? Can you describe what is actually happening in the most precise and the most basic terms? Now, here's what I want you to do, okay? While you're studying physics, whenever you get kind of lost, whenever you get, uh, you get frustrated and you don't understand why we're so caught up in displacement and distance and all that, here's what I want you to imagine, okay? I want you to imagine that you have a friend, okay? You have a friend right here, okay? This is my friend. Uh, I want you to imagine this friend to be blind and also from outer space. He's an alien, okay? You have a blind alien friend and his name is Charles, okay? You want to explain what is happening to Charles, okay? But the problem is he's blind and he's 
an alien. He doesn't understand what you mean by throw the ball because he doesn't have human arms and he has never seen a baseball game before. Do you understand where I'm going with this, okay? Physics is basically trying to define what is happening in our everyday lives, what is happening in the universe in terms of really fundamental basic concepts that even an alien can understand. And that's really jarring for some people. Some people are like, like why, why? It's like an inhumane way of talking. Right? People don't actually do that in everyday conversations. You don't say things like the baseball was traveling initially at a velocity of 20 meters per second. Nobody talks like that. But in physics, when you're talking to this blind alien friend, you kind of have to talk in that way in order to, for you to accurately describe what is happening. Okay? Now, here's an example. Okay? You have your friend Charles, the blind alien, okay? And you're watching the Olympics together, right? And you happen to see Usain Bolt running the 100 meter dash. How would you describe what the 100 meter dash is to this alien life form, okay? So here's Charles, he's blind, he's an alien, he doesn't know what's going on, okay? Now, you wanna explain what's happening to Charles and Charles is like, uh, what's happening? So you have to talk about certain things when you're trying to describe what's going on. Do you follow what I'm trying to say here, right? In order to describe what is happening, you have to talk about things like distance, you have to talk about time, how long it takes, you also have to kind of talk about speed. Now, you can't just say he's really fast in terms of speed, right? Oh, hey Charles, I know you can't see this and I know you, don't have, you have no idea who Usain Bolt is, but he's a really fast runner and the alien looks at you like, how fast is really fast, right? So you can't just use these like laissez-faire, lazy ways of describing things. You have to be very, very accurate and precise. Now, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna try to break down what's happening into key fundamental facts so that an alien can understand. Make sense? Okay, so you have a starting point and you have the final finishing point, right? So you have to talk about things like distance, okay? How long is the race? How long is that man, that object moving? Well, he's moving at 100 meters. And don't say, you know, an alien doesn't understand what a meter is. Hey, an uh, alien can understand basic scientific units, okay? So he understands what meters are. He understands what meters are, okay? So, you're trying to describe what's happening. So you say, okay, this person, this man, is moving at a total distance of 100 meters, okay? How long did it take him? Well, it took him 9.58 seconds, and this is actually the precise, the world record that Usain Bolt currently holds as of 2016, okay? So Usain Bolt ran 100 meters in 9.58 seconds. What about speed? Well. What do we mean by speed? Well, how many meters did he move per second is actually what we're talking about in terms of speed, right? We use these units like kilometers per hour or meters per second, meaning that how long or how much did that object move in one second or one hour, right? In order to get the correct figure for speed, then we divide these two numbers, right? It took him 9.58 seconds to run 100 meters, giving you a speed of 10.44 meters per second. What does that mean? Well, for one second, Usain Bolt moved at about 10.44 uh, meters. That's what we mean by speed. Now, imagine you're an alien, right? And you listen, okay, 10.44 meters per second. Okay. Which direction? Right? You don't get it. 10.44 meters is just a number to you, right? Add to an alien who has no concept of running, who doesn't understand that human beings are bipedal and they run in that direction. To an alien, it doesn't make any sense. This is just a number. So you have to be a little bit more precise than that, okay? So let's think about this. Usain Bolt, this is his actual speed, by the way, okay? When he, run, he ran the world record 100 meter, okay? So if you look at this graph, there's an x-axis and a y-axis. If you look at the labels on the x-axis, it tells 10, 20, 30, 40, this is distance and meters, giving you 100 meters, okay? And on the y-axis, it's showing you his speed, his speed in kilometers per hour. Now, because kilometers per hour is too broad for our taste, I'm gonna convert these numbers into meters per second, okay? So 43.9 kilometers per hour actually converts to about 12.194 meters per second, okay? And 19.4 kilometers per hour actually converts to 5.39 meters per second, okay? Now, this is his speed, right? 100 meters, he's running, right? 
his speed changed from 5.39 meters to 12.194 meters. So, 10.44 meters per second doesn't actually make sense, right? This is not an accurate way of describing how Usain Bolt has ran. Does that make sense, right? If you say that Usain Bolt's speed was 10.44 meters per second, what you're basically saying is Usain Bolt started running the race at exactly 10.44 meters per second, and for 9.58 seconds, he continued to run at that speed until he reached the crossing line. But that's not true, right? We just looked at the graph. It shows that there's a change in speed. So we have to be a little bit more precise, right? The speed of the same bolt has changed during 100 meters, ranging from 5.4 to 12.2 meters uh, per second. So there's a change in speed, but we want to be really, really accurate in when we we're trying to describe what's happening to Charles. So in order to describe this change in speed, we need to talk about acceleration, then we need to talk about force, then we need to talk about mass, and then we also have to factor in air friction, etc., etc., etc. So just by trying to describe this everyday phenomenon of a man that's running 100 meters, you realize that these really broad general words that we use in our everyday language, words like distance and time and speed, well, they're not actually accurate representations. We need really precise terminology in order to actually describe what's happening. Make sense? So we can't be satisfied with using everyday language. We need to think of ways to describe what is happening in the most accurate way possible. And this is a point. This is a purpose of physics. Physics is trying to describe what is happening in our everyday lives in the most accurate way possible so that everybody, given the directions, given the information that you give in a physics terminology, can replicate exactly what is happening in their heads or in an experiment. Make sense? So let's talk about the word distance for a second, okay? The word distance. There's actually a physics term that is better for this situation, and it's called displacement. Now, here's where we start to have a, 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 a gap between everyday language and physics terminology. And this is key for the first lesson, okay? Because this is the first lesson, you kind of have to think about it this way, okay? Uh, talking about these minute differences in terminology, the, the minute differences in meaning, might seem really tedious, it might seem really boring, it also might seem really unnecessary for now. And I get it, I get what you're trying to say, but here's the thing, okay? If you wanna make friends, right? For example, for example, if you wanna make friends and you wanna to talk to, you know, Mike over there, right? Mike seems like a really nice guy, you wanna really get to know him. In order for you to get to know him, what do you have to do? You have to be able to talk to him, right? In order for you to be able to talk to him, you have to, either you know, speak English if he speaks English, or speak Korean if he's Korean. Like You have to speak the same common language in order for you to get to know Mike, right? What you're doing right now is you're basically learning the alphabet. You're learning the common language that people who study physics use so that you can have a conversation with them, okay? And of course it's boring. Who likes learning the ABCs, right? It's only babies who are like two years old that learn the ABC song. Have you ever really enjoyed learning new English words? Uh, unless you're like kind of weird and you like looking at the dictionary or something, most people really don't like memorizing new words, like, you know, learning like, uh, you know, new terminology and grammar. It's all boring stuff. But if you think about it, you have to do it in order for you to communicate with the other person, right? So what you're doing right now is basically learning the alphabet. You're learning the basic grammars of this common language that we call physics, okay? So I know it's really boring. Bear with me for a second. Let's talk about the difference between distance and displacement. Well, first of all, what is displacement? Displacement actually refers to the shortest change in position from point A to point B. What does that mean? Hold on, I'll get to it. The basic units for displacement and distance is usually meters or kilometers. And I'll show you how the, what the difference is, okay? So distance versus displacement. What is the difference? Well, this distance refers to how much ground is covered during an object's movement. So something is moving. I'm interested in how much ground that object covered while it was moving. Make sense? Displacement refers to how much has changed from the beginning of the movement compared to the end, okay? So let's say I'm going to begin moving now, okay? Right now is my initial state, okay? This is when I'm first starting to move. And I start moving and I end up here, okay? This is my final state. I've completed my motion. Now, compared to my initial state, 
I have a final state, okay? I'm not curious about what I did in the middle. I'm just curious about what the difference is between my initial state and my final state. Does that make sense? No, I get it. Hold on, hold on. You'll get it in a second, okay? Distance is a scalar quantity while displacement is a vector quantity. Now, distance is scalar, uh, displacement is a vector. What do these two words mean? We'll talk about it in just a second. Bear with me, okay? Let's look at this example, okay? So you have a ball here, okay? And let's say this ball is moving that way at about five meters, okay? So that ball has moved about five meters that way, and then it moves 10 meters that way, and then 10 meters that way, and then five meters this way, and then uh, 10 meters that way, and then 20 meters, and then 10 meters, okay? So this ball has moved in this path. Now, I'm curious about the distance. How much distance has this object covered while it was in motion? Well, what do you do? You just add up all the meters, right? Because this is moving, and I'm curious about how much ground it has covered. So if you add all this up, you get about 70 meters. So you can say that the distance that the object has covered is about 70 meters. Now, here's my question. What is the displacement of that object? Okay, remember, displacement is looking at the initial position and the final position, and you're comparing the two, okay? Is there a difference between the initial and the final position of that ball? No, right? It started here and moved all the way across, but it ended up, the final position was exactly the same. So there is no difference between the initial and the final state. That's why displacement is actually zero meters. Does that make sense? You get me so far? Let's try one more thing, okay? Same ball, okay? Five meters, 10 meters, 10, five, 10, 20, 10, but in this scenario, the ball ends up here, okay? Now, what is the distance that the ball has covered? Well, you look at the same numbers and you say 70 meters. That's good, okay? Now, what about displacement? Ah, see, there is a difference now. There's an initial position and there's a final position, and these two are not the same. So the displacement actually turns out to be about one meter. There should be no S here, sorry, right? It should be one meter. You understand that there's a difference between what we mean by distance and there's a difference between what we mean by displacement. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so let's go back to our same bolt experiment, right? So we're talking about this man, he's running 100 meters, the distance and the displacement. Yeah, I get it, there's a difference between the two, right? We're using correct physics terminology here. Now, time, how do we measure time? Well, time, 9.58 seconds, well, yeah. Nothing else here, right? Nothing new here. Time is just time. So the, what are the units of time? It's seconds, minutes, hours, etc., etc. right? You all know it. Now, what about speed? Ah, here we get to something really interesting. What do we mean by speed? Is there a better word that we can use to more accurately describe what's happening? And yes, it turns out to be the word velocity. Now, what is the difference between speed and velocity? Well, the term speed and velocity are often used interchangeably, but they're slightly different. Now, again, we come to this gray area where people who are using everyday common language start mixing these two words together interchangeably as if they mean the same thing, right? If you talk about the speed of the fastball and you talk about the velocity of the fastball, it sounds like you're talking about the same thing, right? But in physics, it's actually not true. It's slightly different. And what do I mean by that? Well, speed refers to how much distance was covered over a period of time, okay? Think about this, okay? Speed is related to the distance, how much distance it was covered over a certain period of time. Meanwhile, velocity is actually showing you the displacement over time, as well as the direction. So you're not concerned with distance, you're concerned with displacement now, and in addition to that, you also are concerned with the direction. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll get to it, okay? So the speed and velocity, we figured out to be about 10.44 meters per second. Uh, if you add a direction to that now, okay, instead of just saying 10.44 meters per second, as a blind alien, you have no idea what that means, right? 10.44 meters per second up or down or left or right, right? You're an alien, you don't know what the 100 meter dash is, right? So you have no idea what direction this object is moving. But let me tell you now, I'm gonna tell you that this man moved towards the right at 10.44 meters per second. Now, also, uh, in addition to how fast that object is moving, I'm also giving you information about the direction, right? It's moving towards the right. Now you have something a little bit different, and now you have velocity, okay? So let's talk about speed and velocity a little bit. I know that you're a little bit confused right now. Let's talk about scalar and vector quantities for a second, okay? So speed is a distance covered uh, per amount of time, but speed is a scalar quantity. 
What does that mean? Well, scalar quantity means it's a number that's used to describe magnitude only. Well, what does that mean? I'll give you an example, okay? Let's look at this, right? Some examples, mass, volume, temperature, gigabyte, etc. These are all scalar quantities. So scalar quantities, I want you to think, of it, think about it like this. It's a number, okay? And that number is it. That's what that number means. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, let me give it to you like this, okay? Uh, if I turn the volume up to seven, okay, is there a direction? Yes, you have a, yes, I know, there is a direction. What direction? Well, if you have zero here and 10 here, it's moving towards the right seven, so it's a vector quantity, it has a direction. No, 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 no. Right? Well, who says that zero has to be here and 10 has to be here, therefore seven is right here and it has a direction like this, right? That's just you, right? To an alien, there's no reason why I should have zero here and 10 here. I could have zero here and then 10 over here and seven down here, right? So this direction is actually this way. Does that make sense, right? What you think is a common direction in terms of zero and 10, so zero starting from the middle and it's moving towards the right towards 10, that's just your human experience, right? That's just what you generally think things should be like. It looks okay like this. You've seen it too many times. That looks weird. What the heck are you doing over there, right? But the reason why it's weird is because you're human, right? You're a human being, therefore you've been exposed to so many different graphs and formulas and pictures that have basically this scale. So it looks natural to you. But if you really think about it, the volume seven, does it have a direction though? Right? Seven up or seven down or seven left or seven right, there is no direction. The number seven itself is simply a magnitude. It has meaning in it. I'll give you another example, just in case this is too hard. Uh, I recently bought a computer, and this is actually a true story. Uh, about two weeks ago, I bought a new iMac, right? and it, was, it cost me an arm and a leg. Right? It was super, super expensive. Now, the hard drive space inside my new iMac is about one terabyte. One terabyte to the left does that make sense? One terabyte downwards? No, there is no direction associated. That's simply that number, okay? So a scalar quantity is simply a magnitude. It's one terabyte. That's it. That number itself represents something. Now, I know I'm really confusing a lot of you, so let's quickly move on to the next thing, and we can compare these two things, and maybe that'll help you understand a little bit more, okay? Let's talk about vector quantities. Now, vector quantities are often referred to as the opposites of scalar quantities because they have one key critical difference. Now, what is the difference? Well, a velocity is the amount of displacement over time in a certain direction because it has a magnitude and a direction. That's the key thing. Velocity is a vector quantity. Now, remember scalar quantities, what we just talked about? I told you that scalar quantities only have a magnitude, right? Vector quantities, on the other hand, have both a magnitude as well as a direction, okay? So vectors are represented as arrows. Um, let's see. I'll show you vector quantities, I'll show you the representations in arrows, and maybe that'll help you understand what it means. Okay, hold on, hold on. So, vectors are represented as arrows, okay? And you've all seen this arrow before. Now, just in case you're an alien, let me explain to you what the arrow means, okay? The, there's two parts to an arrow. There's the tail, and there's also the head, okay? The head, this point, this tiny point over here, actually symbolizes the direction of this arrow, right? understand everything here, right? This tail, the length of this tail in terms of physics actually describes the magnitude, right? So let's say I have a force, okay? I have a force that's pushing towards the right in this amount, okay? I don't know what this amount is, but it's a magnitude, it's just some number, okay? And it's pushing this way, in this direction. Now, if this force was smaller, if I had a smaller force that's pushing in the same direction, how would I represent that in terms of arrows? Well, I shortened the length of the tail. Does that make sense, right? This is just innately understandable, right? If you have an arrow and you have a shorter arrow, that means it has a smaller magnitude. So you can show that there's a difference in magnitude just by the length of the tail and the head part of the arrow, the, the head part of the arrow shows you the direction. Now, the thing about vectors is that they can be added or subtracted from one another. And this uh, uh, adding and subtracting vectors is something that a lot of physics teachers spend a lot of time on. I don't really get it because it's 
uh, you all you, immediately, as soon as you see it, you understand what's happening. I'll give you an example. Okay, let's look at this. Okay, so let's say you have a vector force like this moving towards the right at 10 meters per second. Okay, this is a velocity because it has a magnitude as well as a direction. I don't know, if, I have no idea what you're talking about. Don't worry, don't worry. This is just all terminology that you get used to over time. Okay, so let's say I have uh, a velocity uh, going to the right at 10 meters per second. Let's say I have the opposite velocity moving at 5 meters per second. Now, I want you to imagine this scenario like this. Okay. Let's say I, as a human being, am running, okay, I'm running this way, right, I'm running this way at 10 meters per second, okay? Attached to my back is a string, and on the end of the other string, right, there's a dwarf, there's a midget. I'm sorry if I'm not PC. There's a midget, there's this very tiny, small person, okay? That small person is running in the opposite direction, but because he's so small and he's puny, then he only runs at 5 meters per second. There's a big difference in terms of, of velocity. Now, what would happen to my overall speed then, right? I'm moving this way at 10 meters per second. The dwarf is running that way, right? What is happening here? The amount that I can move this way is actually being subtracted because it's in the opposite direction. Does that make sense, right? So if you add up these two vectors, what do you get? Well, it's almost obvious, right? You move towards the right at five meters per second. And that's good. I wanted to try to use that intuition, right? This is just very obvious things. Let's try something else, okay? Same scenario, but this time let's change the direction of the second force. Let's move it like this, okay? What do you think would be the resulting force? What, what's the resulting vector? Well, you add these two things up, right? And you get 15 meters per second in the right, yeah? And uh, you can show that there's a difference in magnitude with the length of the tail. All oh, this is like super easy, right? Let's try one more thing, okay? You have a force moving towards the right at 10 meters per second, but you also have an additional vector that moves up now at five meters per second. Now, how do you add these two vectors together? Well, think about it, right? You start off with your basic x and y axis, right? And you say, okay, you have a force, a vector that's moving towards the right at 10 meters per second. And at the tip of this, you have a force that's moving up, a vector that's moving up at five meters per second. Now, the resulting, the combination of these two vectors results in an arrow that looks like this, right? This is basic intuition. You all understand what this means, right? So this line actually represents the addition of this Fact, uh, vector here and this vector over here. Now, instead of thinking it like this, like a triangle, you can also do it like this. You can move this triangle all the way over there, and then you can start having these connected dotted lines, right? And you can say that the diagonal of the resulting square or the resulting rectangle is actually the combination of these two vectors. Make sense so far? Okay, so the resulting vector is called the resultant, right? And here's my question How do you get the length of the resultant? Okay, so you know that this vector is 10 meters per second, and you know that this vector is 5 meters per second. So what is the resulting? What is the length of the resultant? You have to dig all the way back to, you know, geometry, right? Geometry class when you talked about Pythagorean theorems, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You've all seen this before, right? Now using this basic mathematical formula, you can try to calculate the resultant, right? And you do this, 10 squared plus five squared equals X squared, and then you solve for X, and X results in five square root of five meters per second. Make sense? Right? And this is what I mean, but you have to have a good grasp on mathematics. If this doesn't come naturally to you, I know that this is really hard and you have to use a calculator for this, but if you don't understand the Pythagorean theorem, then you might have some difficulty understanding physics. But if you have trouble with Pythagorean theorems, you need to go back to elementary school because most kids learn about this when they're in like, in like fifth or sixth grade, right? So. Use your basic mathematical tools to understand what's happening. Now, one more thing I want to mention, right? If you have a diagonal vector like this, and let's say it's just an ambiguous unit, I'll call it 50, okay? You have this vector, it's an arrow with the direction with the length of 50. I want you to try to break this down into separate components. And what do I mean by that? Well, this diagonal line is actually a combination of two different vectors like we just seen, right? So you can say that there's a horizontal component as well as a vertical component to this diagonal vector. What do I mean by this? Well, you have a horizontal line that goes all the way down here, and you also add a vertical line, and you end up with this diagonal, right? So a combination of these two vectors results in this diagonal, right? And let's say I give you some numbers. I say that this diagonal line is about 50, okay? It's just a random ambiguous unit of 50, and you have the horizontal component, which has a length of 40, okay? Here's my question. What 
is the amount of the vertical component, right? Again, using the same mathematical formula, you just plug in the numbers like this, and then you also solve for x and you result in 30. Make sense? Right? Uh, you might not understand what's happening right here. Don't worry about it. If you don't get it right now, don't worry. This will come up uh, much later in the course when we're talking about, you know, uh, projectiles, when you're talking about when you're throwing a ball off a cliff, all these like classic physics problems. When we talk about those, then we start breaking down vectors into different horizontal and vertical components. If you don't get it, just understand that there's something like this and this will come up later in the course. Make sense? Okay. So let's go back. Let's go back to our original experiment. Okay. So you have the same bolt and you're watching the same bolt run the 100 meter dash. You have your blind alien friend Charles with you and you're trying to describe what's happening to Charles. Now, you use words like distance, time, speed, and velocity and you say, okay, so what is the total distance that Usain Bolt is running? So you're saying, Charles, hey, Usain Bolt is a man and the distance that he's running is 100 meters. If you want to be a little bit more precise than that, then you say displacement. Okay, what is the displacement between the two? Remember, displacement is a vector, meaning that it has both a uh, magnitude as well as the direction. So you say, okay, Usain Bolt's displacement, the change, the difference between his initial starting point and the final starting point is 100 meters and the direction is towards the right. Okay, so you're trying to explain what's happening in the most precise, accurate way possible. Now, what is the time? Time is just 9.58 seconds. There's no difference, right? All aliens have the same concept of time, let's say, okay? What about speed and velocity? Well, the speed, his speed is about 10.44 meters per second. Okay, what is his velocity? Remember, speed is scalar, velocity is a vector. Vector meaning that it has both the magnitude as well as direction. So you say, okay, it's 10.44 meters, but there's also a direction, and the direction is moving towards the right. Do you see what I'm trying to do here? Right? Instead of using just general, broad, everyday words, I'm trying to be really, really precise with my terminology so that Charles can have a clearer understanding of what's happening. Make sense? But the thing about this, right, speed and velocity here, 10.44 meters per second, it's not actually true. And the reason why it's not true, I'll talk about it in the next lecture, okay? Let's move on for now. So let's quickly review what we learned, okay? I want you to try to organize what you've learned so far inside of your head so that it makes perfect sense. Scalar quantities are magnitudes, okay? These are numbers that have a meaning, and that's it, right? The number itself has a certain amount of meaning to it. For example, you know, the volume or the temperature, right? 37 degrees Celsius. 37 degrees what? 37 degrees towards the left or to the right? No, it's just 37 degrees, right? What does that mean? Well, the number itself has meaning. It's a magnitude, meaning that temperature is a scalar quantity. Now, compared to scalar quantities, there's vector quantities. Vector quantities have both magnitudes as well as directions. So for example, velocity. If I'm moving five meters per second towards that way, instead of just five meters per second anyway, where I'm just saying, okay, that's the direction that I wanna move in, five meters per second. Then if I start moving, then I'm moving with a velocity with both a magnitude, right? Five meters per second and also a direction, right? Towards the right. The distance is a scalar quantity, is a total amount of ground covered by an object during motion. So when we're talking about distance and displacement, distance is the total amount of the area, the length of his path. Okay, how much ground that he's covered when that object is moving? Well, his displacement is actually talking about simply the initial and the final states and you're comparing the two. And if there's a difference, then you draw the straightest line that you can draw possible from point A to point B, from the final and the initial state, okay? Speed is a scalar because we care about the distance covered by an object over time, regardless of where it ends up. So when we're talking about speed, we're talking about the path that the object takes. Whereas when we're talking about velocity, we're only interested in the displacement between the two. Okay, we're not talking about the distance, we're talking about displacement. Now, because displacement shows you initial and the final starting point, then there is a direction, right? You start from here and then you go over there. There's a direction to it. That's why velocity is a vector quantity. Make sense? Now, vectors can be manip manipulated. You can add or subtract vectors together. And I've shown you examples of how to do that. When looking at the diagonal vector, we can separate the horizontal and vertical components as well as calculate for the magnitude of the vectors. And these will all become really, really important when we're talking about force and acceleration and you know, free falling objects, et cetera, et cetera. So just for now, just understand that you can break down diagonal components into both the horizontal and the vertical, okay? Now, next time, we're gonna be talking more about speed and velocity and we'll also be looking at a couple of example problems. So. If you made it this far, good job, <laughs> good job. I'll see you in the next class, but remember, right? Physics, 
You're starting physics right now, okay? Of course it's a little tedious, of course it's a little boring, but it's really important that you take really good notes and you understand everything that's happening right now, right? And if you're confused a little bit about scalar and vector quantities, don't be. Don't be, it's okay. It's not that important in the broad spectrum of things. As time goes by and you learn more about physics, you'll, these are things that come naturally towards you. So if it's a little weird right now, if you feel like it doesn't really fit with you, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just you know, let it breathe, let it marinate for a second and then you'll get it, okay? So I'll see you in the next class.